Hello, and welcome to As the CMMC Turns. I'm Matt Titcomb, the CEO of Peak InfoSec, an authorized CMMC third-party assessment organization. I'm also a CMMC certified professional slash assessor, and I also develop CMMC curriculum. Today's episode is Tips About FIPS, Part 1. Yeah, the original schedule said, we'll do this in one. Yeah, there's a lot to cover in this section alone. This is why this is such a bane for the community. So, speaking of such, um, there's no way we're going to try and cover everything that's plausible under the sun about FIPS validated usage of infrastructure and components. Yeah, people are going to find gaps. People are going to find things. Well, what about? Got it. We're not going to try and cover everything under the sun. Purpose of this is to give you the general, broad understanding and the nuanced details. Well, call us. So the requirements fundamentally are coming straight out of 800-171, shocker, um, that when you have the following requirements, uh, starting with 313-13 to 313-16, you're required to comply with 313.11, which means you have to implement FIPS validated cryptography when related components are processing, storing, and transmitting CUI. Yep, that's what you got to do. Sounds easy, huh? No. All right, so let's take a look a little bit briefly deeper at the requirement here. Now I want to highlight... This is a requirement with one assessment objective. You're either doing this for all components or you're not. It's not a pick or choose of, oh, we got it on for this component, but over here we don't, therefore we're good. No, nope. you don't meet the component level for one component means you don't meet the AO for all of them, which means you don't meet the requirement. That's the way the game plays. Now, there are uh, references in here to both the FIPS and NSA cryptography. Um, it is really hard to find NSA approved cryptography because they keep that behind a CAC wall and then they're a little bit tighter on it. So let's really talk about what is FIPS validated cryptography. Well, this is the official definition uh, from NIST. Now, in reality, what this comes down to is it's a specific set of algorithms that they test and validate do protect uh, data in transit and at rest to the best of the industry's capabilities. Now, quantum computing's coming and this whole thing's going to blow up overnight. Just go watch some horror flicks around that one. But in reality, FIPS validated cryptography comes down to using the correct algorithms with the correct configuration. If you're not doing both, yeah, you may have put the key and open the lock and close the lock and secured it, make sure your door wouldn't be open, but you left the key in. That's an unsecure configuration. Therefore, the lock is unsecure, therefore your door is open. So again, you have to do everything in order for FIPS validated cryptography to be in process um, and in use in your environment. So correct algorithms, correct configuration. Now, where can you find this? Well, you can find uh, the NIST cryptography uh, module validation program, the CVMP, at the website listed here. Now, one of the key things that's on this website, and this is why we, everybody in the ecosystem, hates this area, is the simple fact that NIST has basically told the rest of the federal government, if you're not using validated cryptography, you're not protecting your data. One-to-one -one relationship there. And so there's a lot of people, and I'm one of them. I'd love to see an 800-171 Rev3 to move away from validated cryptography because it is such a pain, it's such a legacy approach to some of us, and it takes so long to do. Um, and, it's, and especially with the quantum changes coming, it's going to take way too long to catch up. So I kind of hope we can find a faster way to do this, but hey, this is the federal government. They never do anything fast. Now, when it comes to the actual validation program, there's three stages. 
There's implementation under test. This is basically saying, hey, we've signed up with the lab to test this. Great, you're on the marketplace. You're kind of listed. Kind of like being a candidate C3PO. All right, yeah, you're listed, but okay. Modules in process, that means they're actually ones they've completed the testing and now NIST is validating the actual requirements and then they were met and, and the lab reports, et cetera. The validated modules at that point in time are those that have passed the uh those in process and are not listed now we'll talk about it but this is your real gospel place to go find out if the components you want to use uh, can meet your requirements for fips validated encryption now speaking of which let's talk about how these are scored on the dodam when it comes down to it the dodam if you don't make one of these it's a five pointer um as of our understanding right now you're not eligible for certification you're not eligible for conditional certification and therefore you're gonna have to redo your entire certification event all over again hint hint wink wink nudge nudge nail your five pointers now the other thing that we understand in conversations from uh, what we've heard verbally. Again, none of this is in writing. This is all verbal, so I wouldn't trust this too far uh, until we see something formal in writing, is that the use of FIPS in process, again, the first two stages of the previous slide, are considered a three-pointer when they're applied to all applicable components, or you've got that mix of some in process and some validated. Um, but again, if you're using one component that is not using FIPS in process or FIPS validated, eh, by default, you drop down to zero points. That's a five pointer, zero points, rule above applies. So make sure you're using FIPS validated encryption as appropriate. So let's kind of cover now the basics. And there's really two types of encryption that we've covered in here. Um, there's data at rest when it's sitting on your hard drive, static systems turned off, etc., or it's in transit. We're only going to cover it rest to, in this, uh, in this CMMC churns. There's a lot even in this one to cover in the time frame we've got. So first requirement is again, the device must be capable of doing it. Um, now this could be, it's got a TPM chip, a trusted processing module chip. It's got correct software, correct hardware combinations of that, that it has to be capable. Now, mobile phones be very leery of Androids. The bulk majority of Androids do not meet FIPS capability. Um, some Samsungs and Google Pixels do, but the bulk majority don't. You really want to guarantee FIPS validation out of the box? Go buy a Mac. Just hands down. Every Mac is shipped FIPS validated. So, again, you want to know what's best? Go use Mac for FIPS validation. Problems, then, generally, I don't recommend it. But that is the easiest one. If you want to do cell phones, using an iPhone-only rule solves this problem across the board. Um, now... The issue with USB sticks and external hard drives um, may be applied. Now, there's some nuances in here we can apply, and we'll talk about those in the tips part following this. And then likewise, if you're backing up your data to, to tape or you're sending it to the cloud, really the FIPS-capable device at that point in time must be the, um, the cloud only for that one. The encryption two tape is actually done on the computer or the server itself so we kind of cover that over a couple now all devices that are using fips based algorithms must be in fips mode this is a part of that configuration uh, that you must be doing this and again maybe for uh and cloud only for those last two now likewise you've got to use fips encryption for the storage of cui that's going to apply to all of these components, bottom line. There are some alternatives we can do for other things, but fundamentally, you are required to use FIPS validated encryption for storing CUI on all of these component types. Um, 
And I do want to make sure we're clear that very first column for computer also includes servers. Yep, they're in scope. Um, now, mobile devices, a little bit of a confusing part here. Uh, the NIST 800-171 definition is just cell phones, tablets, you know, basically those things. DOD's broader definition includes laptops. And then DOD's CMMC definition doesn't include laptops. DOD's confused. Um, hopefully they fix this out in the new rule and they clarify that laptops, you know, again, we just simply say encrypt them. Encrypt everything. It's to your best protection. Um, mobile devices, uh, yeah, we get into Synologies, those things, the really small ones that you can put in your bag and walk out. Yeah, encrypt them too. Um, while in transit, again, this is where things get a little fuzzy, especially for the first three categories. Now, that's a maybe. Let's say you're an IT help desk. You've got to set up a user's account, user PC initially, get them configured. You've got OneDrive configured, and that starts syncing stuff from the cloud. Oh, crap. They're CUI, but they're a remote user, and i got to mail it to them. Oh, you now have to protect it in transit in accordance with all the CUI marking stuff if you're shipping something that already has CUI on there. If it doesn't, yeah, you want to protect it from tampering still. You don't want somebody in that supply chain of mail to tamper with it. So go ahead and protect it as if. Um, but obviously anything you're shipping for tapes and or external storage media must be protected while they're in transit. Now, whether that's encryption or alternative physical means, that's again an alternative that we can talk about in a few minutes. Now, likewise, you do need to protect CUI at storage locations. Now, that storage location could be your desk for an external hard drive, a USB stick, or it could be a server room for all your tapes or the cloud. But again, you must protect CUI. And again, first by default definition, protecting CUI is to encrypt it or provide alternative physical protections. Now let's talk about some data at rest tips. So let's talk USB sticks. These are the first two use cases uh, we tend to run in with USB sticks. Users are notoriously for copying stuff down to USB sticks and not encrypting them before using them. Um, or we run into the device, a CNC machine can't open an encrypted USB stick. So let's talk use case one. Uh, by default, we highly recommend any organization that has to move around uh, CUI on uh, any type of device, we use uh, Kingston Iron Keys. We've got them. We use them ourselves, and they're FIPS validated out of the box. They're encrypted out of the box. They can be centrally managed. Um, so, again, you get all the benefits, and it takes the user out of the loop. It's just hardware-driven encryption. You tamper with that thing, you're going to break it, and it's actually going to destroy it in the process of tampering with it. So again, perfect way to securely move CUI around that it needs to be encrypted. Now in use case two, well in this case, hey, I can't use an encrypted USB when I'm plugging in my CNC machine. Well, use a check-in, check-out procedure. We're now doing alternative physical means here. Secure that USB stick in use. And then make it really nasty that it doesn't just get shoved in somebody's pocket and forgotten about and goes home with them. Take something like that, remove before flight or one of these tags. You know, think of the pen in the in the jar when you're signing for something with a really stupid flower thing on there. They just don't want them stolen. Do the same thing. Make it a pain. Make sure it doesn't go anywhere. And it's checked in, checked out. Now let's talk about the next one. Now, these are going to be your backups and when it comes to FIPS. Now, the first use case here is unencrypted backups to tape. Sorry, guys. Just sending your backups in a little plastic cart, done it, to Iron Mountain is not your answer unless they can demonstrate that they meet NIST 800-171 and are in your flow downs because they are now storing your CUI. They're now part of your supply chain. Um, our recommendations when we get to this, get a fireproof safe and store them in there. Uh, good GSA-proof safe. They can store a boatload of tapes. 
Uh, other habit we're all lazy because we don't want to do is actually get rid of the number of backup tapes you've got. Start calling them down and getting rid of the redundancies that you probably got in there. And then lastly, migrate to backing up everything in the cloud. It's a lot easier, it's a lot less headache, and it's up there and it's on their disks and it's available for you to use. Now, use case two, backing up to the cloud. Hey, guess what? We're now in configuration land. So that cloud service provider must be FedRAMP moderate or equivalent and accept paragraph C through G of DFAR 7012. And they must be configured Configured to be encrypted in the cloud. Yes, you can use Microsoft Azure Backup and Backup Storage Services in GCC High and have it misconfigured. Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Okay, same thing for AWS Glacier. You are responsible for encrypting the data in there and making sure it's configured right. Not AWS, not Microsoft. Now let's talk about HPCs. No, these are notoriously non-FIPS capable. And we really need to cover both data at rest and data in transit for these um, kind of as a composite approach. And we're gonna discuss that in part two. So let's sum up. If you're protecting or encrypting uh, digital CUI, use of FIPS validated uh, algorithms as configured are, uh, Validated algorithms and configs are required generally. There's some tricks around them. You can use them wisely. Uh, if you're doing it for all components, um, well, yeah, if you're not, you're not gonna pass. So make sure you're doing FIPS validation encryption for all components in scope that store, process, or transmit CUI. It's just the way it goes. Um, you can use in process FIPS if the component's not validated yet. Uh, we'll talk about what to do and how you handle that in part two also. Uh, data at rest is actually pretty straightforward. Really the best practice is encrypt everything. Hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. You really do want to. And then lastly, as we already said, high performance compute clusters are hard and we're gonna hit them in part two. Speaking of which, our next CMMC churns is Tips About FIPS, Part 2. Again, I'm Matt Titcomb. Thanks for joining me for the CMMC, CMMC churns this week. Hopefully by next week, I will get my tongue untied and we will go from there. Thank you all.